Well, good morning, Pierre. Thanks for uh, joining me today. I really appreciate that we can be able to have this conversation. So not many people know, but open classroom is important. In this time of pandemic, it's giving people not only the opportunity to survive, but to thrive. And they can take the skills, education, career to the next level. So I'm happy to have Pierre Dubac, the founder, to discuss this important mission. So Pierre, so tell us a little bit about your unique story and what uh, I don't think everybody knows about your company, especially outside of France. So it'll be great if you can tell how you started. I think you started when you were very early, your teens, right? So I think this is a very interesting story that, that, uh, that people can really appreciate. Thank you and good morning, Yang. It's a real pleasure to, to be joining you uh, yet remotely. Um, open Classrooms started seven years ago, but on the basis of a personal project that we initiated with my partner, his name is Mathieu, in 1999. So it's been more than 20 years, actually, that we are creating online courses. And in 1999, we were extremely young because we were in middle school and um, we, we were 13 and 11 years old, and we were interested in creating websites. We couldn't find at this at this time uh, great courses online to learn HTML, how to create um, a, a website. So Matthew started to create the very first course on HTML on web development uh, in French, and he published it online for free to share with some friends to help them create their own websites. And from there, I helped him grow the website, this learning, online learning community, all for free for many, many years, parallel to our studies in middle school, in high school, in college. And then it became the reference platform to learn coding in French speaking countries. Um, at this stage, we didn't have um, a business model. It was not a company, it was just a personal website for free, um, but we already had hundreds of thousands of learners every month. And then at the end of our studies, we decided, okay, maybe we're gonna make it for a full-time job and create um, a start company. So this is Open Classrooms in 2013. So we created Open Classrooms as a mission-driven company. And the mission is to make education accessible. And when I first met you, I was extremely impressed by what you're trying to do, this is even before pandemic, and you, you started this company really young age, and the, uh, in a time where internet and uh, online education isn't as popular, so I would say you are one of those pioneers. What are, what are the challenges do you see today, and uh, how are you addressing those challenges? Uh, we've got many operational challenges actually right now um, because COVID has really accelerated um, the transformation from in-person education to online um, as we are on uh, the higher education segment, but also on lifelong learning and reskilling and upskilling. Um, so we've seen a strong acceleration and an uptake in enrollments, in usage, um, a, a shortening of the sales cycle in B2B as well, and also um, a really strong growth of uh, the number of reskilling programs for job seekers, notably because of uh, the economic downturn. So the main challenge right now for us is to uh, be able to deliver more and more uh, degree programs to students. The second one I, 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 I'd comment on um, is the well, ability to replicate the model in other countries, the internalization of a model, and especially when it comes to um, regulatory environments, because we, we're a degree awarding um, institution. So we're a college, a fully fledged college with degree accreditation, but degree accreditation is um, something that works on a, on a country basis. Um, so it's only country by country, and then you have to replicate the process. And the process to get a degree accreditation usually takes between four to nine years in every country. So it's really long. Um, and we need to replicate this. So this is also one of our challenges. So clearly what you're describing is a classic case of startup to scale up operational challenges and as you're going to global footprint, global footprint replication challenges, 
And these are very typical startup issues that one have to go through as you want to permeate and share your uh, class uh, uh, programs to the global basis. Now, if I remember when we met uh, multiple times, but I remember last time I asked you, what are the key differentiators of your program? And it's, I just remember a couple of key things that was unique in my view. You said that, uh, you know, we guarantee the diploma programs when your students are in the program for job change and being able to learn new skills, you guarantee to getting a new jobs uh, as they are looking for the opportunities for change. And, so they, and you, in fact, I think you said you reimbursed even the uh, tuition that they pay. I thought that was really unique and uh, ambitious. So can you share with, with us an audience about what are some of the unique things you are doing to help people to change their careers? Sure. Um, it's a really good question. Um, so what we, what we do precisely um, is that we create and operate and deliver degree programs leading to tomorrow's jobs. So we offer associate bachelor's and master's degree programs fully online, and they lead to jobs, jobs mostly in the tech and digital industry, but also on processor jobs. So tech and digital would be coding, AI, cybersecurity, digital marketing, agile, product management, UX design, that kind of jobs. And then we've got also transversal jobs like HR, or sales, or management, finance, accounting, communication, etc. We cover 50 jobs in total, all in English and in French. Um, we go all the way from orientation, helping people to find out what their career could look like, uh, which path they're willing to take, um, admissions, enrollment, training, project-based learning, the mentorship component that I, I talked about, we're going to assess your competencies, um, the competencies you need to get the job, and those competencies will lead you to a degree. So you're going to get a master's degree on data science, uh, on data science to become a data scientist. And towards the end of the program, we're going to offer you individual career coaching, again, via video conference with one of our career coaches uh, to help, help you find a job, a good job, aligned to your degree, um, but also potentially to help you create your own company or become an independent worker, if you will. Uh, we do guarantee you a job, meaning if you don't find a job within six months after your graduation date, we're going to refund your tuition fees. Uh, so it's a really strong commitment for us. It's also a way to align our social impact to our financials and to our commercial goals. Meaning if we make revenue, we're going to deliver on a strong, positive social impact with the job placement. And this is the way we actually track our social impact as a mission driven company is through the number of job placements, the number of students we place in the workforce, either young people finding their first job, either employees upscaling, getting a promotion, or switching careers, doing a mobility within the same employer, or job seekers, getting back to the job market and finding a job again. That's great. So, Pierre, I think it would be great if you can actually give some more background to the audience, the size and scale that you are in, because you're not just a small company, you actually done what I read is over three and a half million people have taken your classes around uh, many countries. So if you can give your perspective of the scale and size of the program you are running, as well as the some of the successful programs that help the people to uh, find new jobs that may be interesting for people to listen to. Um, so indeed, we, we train millions of students every month. Um, in 140 different countries. It's mostly in Europe, in North America, and in Africa. Um, the three main types of um, students that we have are young folks um, between 18 to 24. Um, students, basically, uh, we would call them non-traditional college students. Uh, usually, those non-traditional college students 
could be school dropouts um, or people with disabilities or living in a remote area, not having access to education. Then the second target is uh, employees. Um, so they could be from anywhere from, anywhere from 25 to 50 plus, and they're looking for an internal or external mobility. So it could be promotion, it could be upscaling, it could be rescaling and, and getting a new job or getting a new job also elsewhere. And then finally, we've got job seekers and job seekers um, uh, also between 25 to 50 plus. Um, they want to learn a new job in high demand and find a job as fast as they can. Um, and it's quite balanced um, on, on the three different categories. Um, but then depending on the path, because we go all the way from entry level positions to really advanced and senior positions. Um, so we can train school dropouts on you know, the first um, modules of an associate. Um, an associate degree program up to you know advanced AI and machine learning engineering at the master's level. Um, so it's all the way up. And, and the full spectrum, so we have obviously a different audience depending on the program. Um, and on some programs, we target especially five categories of populations um, for social impact. Um, it's about the five categories of population we think are um, further away from um, a stronger employability. So we've got job seekers, we've got refugees, we've got people with disabilities, we've got school dropouts, and we've got people living in underprivileged areas. So we're more deliberate, we're more intentional to target those uh, populations and find also ways to finance um, their tuition fee through apprenticeship programs with employers or with charities, foundations, or public authorities financing their studies with us. So you're actually running a really good social impact program that are inclusive, including a lot of people that might not have an opportunity to learn and, and educate and further ahead in their career. So that's Really, really happy to hear that given I'm also very much uh, supporting the uh, this UN 17 sustainability goals, particularly around education and inclusiveness. Now, tell us about the what are the, some of the uh, universities and education programs you have today? Because you're clearly doing something that are different, but yet very important part of education. So tell me your candidate assessment of how is the traditional education is like today? And do you think given where we are, the COVID-19 will continue? Or do you think it's gonna change drastically going forward with a different kind of hybrid approach that are, that are changing the way we're gonna educate our children or even educating our workers? Mm -hmm. It's a really good question. And I think it depends, the answer depends on the market, first of all. Um, in Europe, it might be different from the States, from Africa, from Asia, etc. Um, the first comment I'd make on this is we tend to polarize um, traditional in-person education versus online. Um, but I think actually the strength of open classrooms is not that is online. It's more that it's focused on the employability of our students. So we're teaching skills, competencies. We're teaching you um, a new job, a job in high demand uh, through projects, through one-on-one -on -one mentorship, with career coaching. And it's more about the, metho the methodology, the pedagogy um, that is new compared to a more traditional four-year long bachelor's degree with, you know, credits and general education and lectures and you know that kind of system. Um, I think this is actually the biggest shift. Um, and you can do that on campus or you can do it online. We do it online, but you can also teach this way, teach differently um, in a more career oriented way uh, on campus. I think um, most higher education institutions will have to rethink the way they teach 
um, and especially um, it will force them to be more career oriented, uh, to take care, especially of the student outcomes. How many students graduate? How many students find a job? Which type of jobs? Like, is that a good job? Uh, what salary? What is the average salary that they can get, et cetera, et cetera? Are the competencies of those graduates in, in line to what employers require in the local community? Those are really important questions. And it will probably force um, the shift to a competency-based education but also to more online education to keep it affordable. And as you know, in the States, um, affordability of higher education is a massive issue with the raise of student loans and you know, um, the, the increasing uh, tuition fees that families um, have to burden with loans for many, many years. So Pierre, do you think there is an end of a traditional educational system? And do you think it's going to change profoundly? I don't think it's the end. I think Harvard and MIT will still be there next year and probably in 10 years. I do think there'll be a massive uh, shift for more B and C players in the category, I'd say. Um, I think Ivy League universities uh, will have to evolve, but won't disappear. And I'm sure many people will still want to have the full courage experience whenever the pandemic will be over. When you look at um, college students in America right now, actually the majority of those college students are not people are around 18 and early 20s. They're actually in their 30s, 30s, 35 years old, you know, and they already had maybe 10 years of work experience, but they don't have a college degree and they go back to college to get this college degree and fast track their career. Um, and those people don't care that much about the college uh, experience in the South, like the, the campus life. And that will force, you know, um, the re-engineering of the programs clearly. Um, so I, I'm not so much worried about the first category of universities, the research universities, but more about the vocational training providers, lifelong learning, uh, about community colleges. I think those institutions will will face challenges and will will also have huge opportunities to widen their um, their population, their audience. Very good. So upscaling, rescaling, apprenticeship, all these programs are helping really changing the people adapted to uh, jobs that could be impacted by technology, digital transformation, and how do you adjust and how do you adapt and how do you educate and how do you be able to contribute. And I think these are challenges all the corporations that think about. And I think you are really providing a tools and opportunity to enable that. So thank you very much, Pierre, for contributing to the society and making an impact. Thank you, Young.